Hi everyone, Vegas from Critic here, Jeffrey K. Howard here to review Blade Runner 2049, one of the most anticipated sequels 30-something years in the making. I was about 15, 16 years old when the original came out, and I remember seeing it and just being blown away by it. Not understanding a damn thing about it, and after maybe 200 viewings later, I am still don't understand everything that's going on in Blade Runner. And I think that if you just stop trying to think about it and just let it kind of you know, wash over you and just kind of experience it more than understand it. And uh, I hated the narration. I absolutely hated the narration. It took 20 years to get the special edition DVD or laser disc out that didn't have that horrible Harrison Ford narration because the studio thought, you know, no one's going to understand what's going on here. So they told Ridley Scott, uh, the director, to say, hey, we got to put this in there. And I thought it just ruined it. But now it works so much better without it. Also, I don't know if you ever read Future Noir, The Making of Blade Runner. Have you seen this book? Man, I think I've read this thing, you know, a dozen times. It's just so fascinating, the history of that movie. Now, of course, you know, Blade Runner is not for everyone. It's hardcore science fiction. It's the kind of science fiction I like. I like that industrial punk kind of dirty future like that. And it's real funny to watch it now and see all the, you know, the sponsors that are gone, like Pan Am and all these others. Uh, but, you know, so I've been waiting for this sequel. I'm very excited about it. And I love the director, even though I didn't like Arrival last year, Dennis Villeneuve. I love Sicario. I love his style. So I thought, really, Scott's executive producer. We got Harrison Ford back. Ryan Gosling is awesome. What could go wrong? Plenty could go wrong. And I know uh, other critics have just been really all over me about my attitude towards this film, so I'm going to try to explain to you that I'm mixed on the film. Didn't hate it, and I didn't love it. It may require, you know, three or four or ten viewings for me to really understand it, maybe appreciate it. I've been wrong before. But uh, we went to our press screening last week, and they made us wear little armbands to get in there. I thought, I did I save it? No, I didn't. I wore it as long as I could. It was really funny because I'm like, there was like ten of us in the audience, you know. But Warner Brothers was really kind of protective of this, of this movie. And not only that, they had this whole... Uh, thing they read at the end of the screening about the messages from the director and directors from the studio saying don't reveal plot points to it. They were just telling us how to review the film. Now, I'm like, look, I'm not going to reveal any spoilers. This is spoiler free. There's plenty of them in this movie, trust me. Uh, but a lot of the critics were like, re you know, rebelling, going, hey, you can't tell us what to do. So that was that was pretty interesting. So this movie already, before I even saw one frame or one digital pixel, uh, was already causing all controversy in our audience. So I thought it was really like, wow, this is going to be a roller coaster ride. So essentially, without giving any spoilers away, the movie is Ryan Gosling is a replicant, I guess you could say a robot, for you who don't know the movie. Um, and he's on this mission to find uh, something that's going to endanger mankind. I could say that. You know, without giving anything away, at the beginning of the film, they say the Tyrell Corporation, remember in the original film, he's dead. Uh, Jared Leto, uh, uh, his character came to prominence by having, you know, this technology to feed the world because we're overcrowded, and he bought Tyrell's technology. So now he's working on these replicants to be, you know, slaves, essentially, to do things that human beings can't do. Uh, but there's something else going on. There's a secret that he's hiding. There's a secret that his company has that Gosling is, is stumbling upon as he gets uh, more more into the investigation, which of course leads to Harrison Ford. He's the key to everything. And uh, that's not giving anything away either. That's in the trailer. So first of all, let's just say the aesthetics of the film, brilliant direction, brilliant lighting, incredible music, very Vangelis, uh, very uh, incredible colors and mood. And it is everything I expected what Blade Runner was going to be, 2049. And, you know, just be giving that kind of artistic kind of uh, experimental wash that came over to me. I'm just like, you just give yourself up to this movie. Now, I had trouble with the story because basically there wasn't a story. There was maybe a little bit of premise, right? And I want a little bit more mainstream for this movie. I know I, the original film was kind of was groundbreaking. You could get away with that. But my criticism with this movie is, being $150 plus million, it needed to be more mainstream, okay? Because they were making a movie for fans of this movie from 30 years ago that anyone under, you know, 25 ha has absolutely no idea. Maybe 30. It doesn't have any idea what this movie is. Uh, that some people I've been reading have been seeing it, and they're, like, mixed on it. So they didn't have... They didn't have something built in for the younger audience who had never seen the original or didn't even care about the original. So the movie just really remained true to being this weird, abstract kind of, you know, film that just didn't appeal to a wider audience. I think you could add the little spoilers in there that are great for the fans like me, but I wanted more action sequences. I wanted more of a kind of a streamlined, mainstream plot. You know, why couldn't Gosling have a couple other missions that he was kind of fishing up to kind of wean us into the movie? Uh, there was just too much of the film that just 
didn't it just didn't work for me because the pacing was too slow uh, I, I just I didn't keep my interest so after a while I kind of just shut down and just kind of just let the visuals take over you know but I know a lot of people I kept saying to myself look if you're gonna make a movie like this something for the fans you know this really obscure movie from 30 years ago you needed more appeal to it you needed a better story more storylines something that appealed to women nothing in the movie appealed to women whatsoever and I was just reading a critic how I was objectifying women too you know they're all you know prostitutes or they were all you know they weren't in the most glamorous roles you know like Wonder Woman and you know and then I love the storyline between Ryan Gosling and his artificial intelligence. That was his, uh, what was her name? I don't know, look, I'm going blank on her name. Uh, Anna D. Aramis. That was fascinating. It really was to see that, you know, he preferred to have an artificial intelligence that uh, he walked around with, you know, on a little flash drive that was his companion, you know, his lover, his everything, his best friend. So I thought, wow, what a, it's almost like that movie Her, you know, with Joaquin Phoenix. You had an artificial intelligence with another artificial intelligence. I just thought that was a really fascinating story. That, that always fascinated me in the movie. And now in terms of performances, okay, now put your seatbelts on. I love Ryan Geisling. That man, I love him in The Nice Guys. He can do comedy. We won't talk about La La Land. You know me in that attitude of that. Uh, but uh, he was brilliant. He really was. And then we had uh, Harrison Ford, who you were waiting for him throughout the most of the movie. I think he's maybe got 20 minutes in this whole three-hour thing. Yeah, it's three, almost three hours long. And at the beginning of his, of his um, where he was uh, introduced, he was a tough guy, right? And then the rest of the movie, he was like a dodgy old kind of like feeble kind of guy. He, you have to see the movie to understand. So that really upset me what they did with his character. Jared Leto, what was he in this movie for? Every time he showed up, he just had these long monologues, these soliloquies of mankind and the future and all. And it just, I was like, what? I mean, get over yourself. Stop talking, talking in riddles and being, I just thought he was terrible in this. I really did. I don't know if it was more him or more but just the, the script you know Hampton Fancher returned after 30 years to do this screenplay and uh, so, oh, I, I was just it was driving me crazy it really was um, uh, uh, Dave Batista who was in the beginning of the film big tough guy he was awesome in it uh, and then also uh, wait, wait, what I wrote it down Lenny James yes we said that from uh, the Walking Dead and he was amazing I wanted more of those weird characters that we had in the first film like James Hong who made their eyes or uh, just like the, the toy maker we needed more characters to kind of keep this kind of bizarre kind of world going on so I don't know how much time is that God, I'm rambling on for eight minutes like there so I'm really torn on this film I wanted to like it more than I should and I just had too many problems with it. So I'm not saying don't see it. I'm not saying it's, oh my God, they ruined everything. I just think there were so many things that Warner Brothers could have figured out um, to make it more mainstream, to make us more successful. Because I just kept saying to myself, who's going to see this movie? Okay, there's nothing, there's nothing exciting about it. There's nothing kind of linear for an average audience, you know, moviegoer to go to. Even for someone like me, who's like been a fan of the movie for, for decades, you know, I'm like, okay I understand what the original was but this is 2017 you spent 155 million dollars that's that's just a little bit more appealing to the mainstream audiences and people go oh wait a minute and the critics calling me in Jeff this is art you know how can you sacrifice that and you know it's not art when it's 160 million dollars and when you know studios are online with the, the bottom line it is also a business okay so you have to balance art and business together okay and they didn't do this with Blade Runner and uh, it was really cool I don't want to give it away but they do have a little homage to Vegas in there with that it was really cool it was a surprise to that uh, but overall you know, visually, it's amazing. No one's going to question that. And, you know, Villeneuve's direction. No one's going to question the aesthetics of this film. But when it comes to the screenplay, it comes to the pacing, and it comes to the three hours, almost. I mean, come on. This isn't Gone with the Wind. Anyway, that's how I feel about it. Blade Runner 2049. Get ready for the hate mail. I, I understand that. But I didn't hate it, and I didn't love it. I'm mixed. That's what we call mixed. All right, for more reviews and interviews, surf on over to my website, VegasFilmCritic.com. Uh, also, check me out on social media, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook. Did I say that? You know, all that stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe so you won't miss any of my future reviews and interviews. I'm Jeffrey Garrett here in Las Vegas, and I'll see you in 2049. It's in Blade Runner. I'll see you next time.